to Dr. Uh, Ruth Fletcher, Senior Lecturer in Medical Law, uh, Queen Mary University, London. You're very welcome to this, meetings, uh, 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 this meeting this afternoon. And are you aware of the laws around privilege and qualified privilege? Because I, I read them earlier, so are you happy for me not to read through That's all of those fine. again? Yeah, so because um, I can do so, no problem. But um, I now call on you to make your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. And thanks to the members of the committee for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be able to draw on the research and teaching I've been doing in the area of medical law to be able to think practically about how we might build on the insights of the Citizens' Assembly and think about how we can practically translate that into um, legislation. And so I thought in this presentation I would just pick out some key points from the submission I made. And before I get to focusing on how we might translate the Citizens' Assembly recommendations in relation to on-request models and in relation to criteria for access um, in the later stages of pregnancy, there's two framing issues really I just wanted to focus on. And the first one is in relation to the trend towards decriminalisation and the significance of decriminalisation and that that is an option that committee members have in, in order to progress the framework within which uh, the, the Citizens' Assembly recommendations might take effect. And so basically with decriminalisation of abortion, with the trend, this is part of an international trend at the moment, as I'm sure you know, so that even though there are extensive even though um, there are significant uh, criminal prohibitions in many different countries, at the moment we are seeing a trend towards taking the criminal law out of the regulation of reproductive health care and abortion in particular. And that is partly because um, it's about really the right tool for the job. In a sense, um, criminal law is not the right regulatory tool for regulating reproductive health care. And so what people are, what the, the main argument around decriminalisation of abortion health care at the moment is about taking the punitive aspect of law, taking punishment out of the regulatory toolbox that is available for different kinds of abortion care. And so that's one key reason why people find it persuasive to take that punishment element out of the regulation of abortion care, as I say, because that is having a chilling effect on professionals providing uh, quality abortion care and health care, and because it does um, stigmatise this kind of reproductive health care and because it does have an impact in the sense that we have seen um, individual prosecutions and there's fear and stigma then attached to that for individual users of abortion care. But taking, um, taking abortion care and reproductive health care, taking the criminal law out of that regulation, decriminalising, doesn't it's important to remember that that's not about deregulation, right? And it's not about full legalisation. Decriminalisation is about, as I say, removing the punitive element, but there are still lots of other legal tools available to make sure that uh, good practice is promoted and that poor practice is held to account. And so that would be the function of the civil law in relation to the tort of negligence, for example, and it would also be the function of professional regulation. So in medical law, we have other legal tools available to hold good practice to account, to promote, promote that good practice. Criminal law doesn't need to do it. The second key point is that decriminalising doesn't necessarily mean you're fully legalising something. You can still adopt criteria that make certain kinds of abortion care lawful and unlawful. It's just, again, that you might use other sorts of public tools, such as incentive measures, funding measures, even information, in order to, um, to monitor that boundary between what's lawful and what's unlawful. So that's the first kind of key framing issue that we might want to think about a bit more that might help implement the recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly. The second is um, uh, the guarantee of access that I've proposed in the um, third part of the provisions that might implement Citizens' Assembly objectives. And that's about... Um, making clear that there's a public responsibility to provide abortion care to the highest uh, attainable standards. And so again, you have two framing measures begin the statutory provisions in a possible bill that would implement the Citizens' Assembly 
decriminalisation and then on the other hand a positive guarantee of access to make sure that the, it's the Minister for Health, the public system which is responsible for ensuring access um, and for implementing principles around non-discrimination. And so that not only does it seek to make sure that there's a level of public responsibility for delivery of a quality service, but it also attempts to redress the past situation in the sense that we know that the negative effect of abortion restriction has been most um, keenly felt by those who are most disadvantaged. So we can address that by making a guarantee of access as clear as possible. So those are two framing points that I'd be delighted to take questions and comments on. The, then to just speak, to focus on what, we're rec what I'm recommending in terms of the actual grounds themselves then and how it might be the, the best and clearest way to implement the Citizens' Assembly um, uh, recommendations. The first would be in relation to language which might implement the on-request model. And so basically there are three main reasons why parliaments and people have found on-request models persuasive. And two of them are related to women-centred arguments, but one is related to a more fetal life-centred argument. And so obviously on-request models are, um, have been received public support because they take women's wishes seriously. And so um, that's one of the key reasons. A second key reason is because they make it easier, they make the less, of, they mean there's less obstruction, less harm for the particularly vulnerable cases. So making ab ab abortion available on request means that the barriers and the scrutiny that might come with um, particular pathways for, partic for rape victims, for women who have serious health conditions, on request models work best in terms of facilitating access for that vulnerable group of, of, um, of uh, abortion seekers. But the third reason is because on request models, as I think you've been hearing, tend to have the, an impact that they, are, they make it more likely that abortion will be earlier, provide a veil of at an earlier period rather than a later period. And so there is a way in which, in effect, if one takes the view that fetal life develops more value in a gradual way over time, and if one doesn't have an absolutist value on about fetal life, but like lots of people think that fetal life deserves some respect, but just doesn't deserve the same kind of um, legal recognition that women's lives do. And so there are ways in which lots of different legal regimes have recognised that fetal life, the prenatal life, deserves some sort of respect, and therefore on request models actually can deliver on that to some extent in the, in the sense that they make it more likely that abortion would be earlier rather than later. And so the effect of them is to also um, speak to people's concerns that prenatal life should have some respect but just not in the same way that women's lives might have. And so then the other issues in relation, to think about in relation to abortion on request, and I've recommended that we follow Citizens' Assembly uh, recommendations by providing that a person who is not more than 12 weeks pregnant may access abortion on her request and without the need to demonstrate indications other than her own wishes. So again, it's the, wish, the woman's wishes would be the main criteria for accessing on and on request ground. Um, there are lots of different, one thing to think about in relation to that is it might be possible given what the Citizens Assembly recommended and given um, recommendations from World Health Organization guidelines and given the kind of variety that you've been looking at in the earlier sessions, it might be possible to extend that period from 12 weeks up until something more like 22 weeks, which 44% obviously of the Citizens Assembly also um, that 44% constituency looked at. So the final point then is just in relation to how to translate the types of recommendations that speak to making access available later in pregnancy um, for particularly vulnerable groups. And what I've recommended in relation to that is that we have a 
a ground which would allow a person who is no, no more than 12 weeks but not more than 22 weeks pregnant, for example, could access an abortion where an appropriately qualified medical practitioner determines that the abortion is appropriate in all the circumstances and then in making that determination the practitioner shall have regard to the pregnant person's own wishes, feelings and thoughts on her current and future circumstances. So there is a way of making sure that the pregnant woman's concerns are part of that process, but you still have an approval process for later, um, for later terminations. And an appropriately qualified medical practitioner, that language um, could include nurses and midwives, for example, could expand the provision and enhance a, locally, um, a local service in that regard. In relation to after 22 weeks, where the Citizens' Assembly wanted access at that point to be still available, um, where there was risk to the person's life or a, a risk to health, um, or in cases of fatal anomaly, the, um, the idea would be that the Medical, the appropriately qualified medical practitioner could consult with a second uh, appropriately qualified practitioner, and, but that you would make it available on the pathway, the legal pathway of a risk to the pregnant person's life or health. And so here the point is that there's a difference between the reasons people have in particularly vulnerable situations uh, in relation to um, serious risks to health or in relation to rape, for example, or in relation to carrying a pregnancy with a serious anomaly. Those are the, the, the particularly vulnerable reasons people might have for wanting access to abortion later in pregnancy. But we don't have to necessarily use that language in the law. The language we can use in the law can be a, a more open ground like risk to health and or life um, and in that way you remove the ways in which criteria like rape grounds or anomaly grounds or a finding of serious risk um, can be an obstruction and instead you put it into the code of practice or to guidelines the details around what circumstances might qualify. So those are really the main points that I wanted to um, emphasise in relation to the submission and I look forward to discussing in more detail. Thank you very much.